So I have been teaching for eight years now, and originally, like many Amer- Western foreigners in Asia, they are teaching English, teaching ESL, just as a means to travel. So that means that they're not necessarily professional teachers or have any practical knowledge, but they're just using a language they know to make money while traveling. And about eight years ago, I would have fell into that category, but Throughout these eight years, I've taught nearly every day of my life, doing nearly 30 hours a week of teaching. So over time, I have considered myself a experienced teacher, and I do have qualifications in teaching English as a second language. Um, on top of that, I have studied Chinese language in China, Wuhan University, for four years. During that time, I was still teaching English every day to from everyone from two-year-olds to university students. And from teaching English in Vietnam and in China, primarily my students were those from well-off parents who are dreaming of sending their kids abroad to Ivy League schools, or they have these dreams of their kids being professional English. But the border, the bottom line is that all these students come from parents with money. Mm. And with the skills, and I feel like over the years, I've become a pretty adept teacher. And I wanted to take what I've learned and the skills that I have acquired from teaching English in China and Vietnam and apply that to a place where the students could get the most benefit from it. Okay. So therefore, I am now teaching at a, in a small village in Nepal where I am not only teaching the students, but I'm also training teachers to change the practices to better reach their students. Great. Like you were talking earlier about um, the um, cultural dissonance, um, sort of to immerse yourself um, in a system which is very different from um, your upbringing if you have your high school. And, U.S. and it is generally encouraged to ask questions, be critical of the things that you hear, um, have a discussion about that, and this is what you're evaluated for to be able to think critically. Um, when you went to China, um, we were having a conversation about that. It was a lot different. You know, things that were taught were the last word, and debates weren't really encouraged, and you also found that to be true in other students um, in your class, then, I mean, going through your bachelor program for four years through such a culture, which I can only assume would be a shock in the beginning, um, 
in some way, how do you actually translate um, that experience into your own teaching practice? And then you certainly had some challenges with your work also. So can you tell me a little bit about that? So even in China, when it comes down to what makes a good teacher, what makes a bad teacher, and the practices that I've grown up with in the United States, whether they encourage discussion, many of the te teachers in China, the best teachers, encourage discussion. So it's not even a concept of what is East and what is West. It is what is progress. And due to um, enlightenment periods in, in terms of progressive thinking, it just happens to be in the 20th century, 21st century, that the West has been a hub for these ideas and they've spread. That's not to say that no other country has contributed, but in general, progressive teaching styles have started, in, as you well know, Sweden and places such as that. In America, we've emulated Sweden. Um, so some of my best teachers in China, and they're there, and they're mostly younger teachers, yeah. they would encourage discussions, and they're having trouble reaching other Chinese, Korean, Thai students. And why is that, if I may interrupt? Because many of these students are incredibly passive, and I find East Asian students, um, we were talking earlier about how it's usually girls in okay. South Asia, but in East Asia, I would say boys and girls are incredibly passive. They come into a classroom, they say, hello, sir, and then maybe you do a bow to show respect. But during class time, the teacher will talk for an hour, and everyone else is invisible. So as long as the students are quiet, they can be on their phones, they could be asleep, they could be doing whatever. But as long as they're quiet and the teacher's talking, then the class is deemed a success. Why do you think is, that is the case? You know, people generally don't find lectures engaging and immersive, or it's just like, it's a part of culture, you know, you're not supposed to question what you're being taught, or they simply don't put enough effort in their lectures, you know, it's just, you know, run of the mill and it's going to end by the semester and then you cram your notes and you pass and then you get good GPA and then you move on to Ivy League school. I mean, what do you think is the reason for that? When I would have conflicts with some of my teachers, because me personally, the way I learn is you give me information. I want to say that information back to you and process it and maybe ask questions about certain things, not even challenging, but to get in for more information about something. Or if I don't necessarily agree with something, to have further clarification. So I don't necessarily consider that challenging a teacher, but these teachers, not all the time, but most of the time they would refuse to answer my question or acknowledge me. And it's mostly because like many students, they memorize these speeches. So for a whole hour, they'll memorize this lecture. So if I am asking a question or asking for clarification, I'm interrupting their lecture. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, if you have a question, wait for the after after the class, which I think is ludicrous because maybe my question would be one that everyone else would have. And we could have a discussion because I think discussions help students learn. But I find that many of the teachers that I had in China, their uh, main goal during a class period was to get from this page to this page in the book and nothing should get in their way during that. So if everyone else is quiet during that time, perfect, as long as they are able to get from point A to point B. Okay, well that certainly doesn't look like a way to promote um, alternative points um, and criticism and, um, you know, thinking um, in depth about a topic. But then generally, if, um, to put in your words, the point is to get from point A to point B and cover all the syllabus that they are assigned to cover, how does it translate into examination? For example, if you were to appear in an exam, I mean, you're supposed to cram all those points from A to B and just reprint it without a critical discussion. I mean, don't they have like outcome-based education and learning where you actually have to demonstrate that you have mastered a concept and you can understand that in its different nuances and then you can reproduce original thought? I mean, how is it possible if that's the pedagogy that they follow? In my opinion, I think I definitely agree with you. You give me information, and I should be able to process that information and even put it in my own words. Chinese teachers, and I think many other countries fall victim to this, if it's in your own words, they consider it incorrect. They want it word for word what it is in the textbook. And even if you reword it, even if the idea is exactly the same, they'll consider it incorrect because it's not what the textbook says. 
So the result of this, the result of just having a lecture or a speech, and you're not even evaluating if all the students are comprehending it or learning it, and then giving them an exam, the end result is usually cheating. That's what the yeah. students resort to. If you want a word-for-word -word answer from a book, fine. They're going to come into class with a scrap of paper, hide it underneath their desk, and they're going to copy it word for word. And I think it comes down to if you comprehend something, you should be able to summarize it in even a more simple way. And I think that's what makes a good teacher. If you can take something complex and explain it in a way that everyone can understand, that is successful. Not saying something that's purely academic, not saying something that only the well-learned and well-versed in the subject can understand, but it's something that you can take something complex and give it to somebody who knows nothing about the topic. And I feel that many of these teachers, in my experience in Nepal too, they're focusing on the purely academic while they need to be teaching to the students. Okay. So I, mean, I can identify with um, this experience in my undergraduate classes also, and that's kind of unfortunate that at this level in the university where they should be mastering critical thinking and innovative ideas and um, to be able to reproduce um, ideas um, with a new um, aspect of it or new ways of looking at uh, same theories, but that unfortunately cheating is a very common problem. Now, now that you and I have the opportunity to actually go to the class, come on the other side of the table, and, you know, be a role model, so to speak, um, and then we were sharing the experiences of you know cheating is still a huge problem. I mean, um, be it children at the younger age uh, or be at university level, I and mean, it's a very common problem. How do you actually uh, approach this issue in a way that students understand that you know cheating is probably not the end of um, their academic career, that that's not going to bring any prosperity or learning um, throughout their life, and uh, this is something that's stopping them from growing in many ways. I mean, what do you think are some of the ways that um, we can address this problem? Well, I've only been teaching in Nepal for the last six months, just about, and it's still a problem I'm tackling with myself. And what is unfortunate is that in my classrooms, it's not the low and performing students that cheat, it's everyone. From the smartest kids that don't need to cheat down to the students who have never showed up for a single class. And I've noticed they share all the answers with each other. And when we had our first um, exam period, first of all, I hold them all accountable and I discipline them. And as strict as that may sound, students need to be held accountable. Sure. And I have high expectations for this, my students and I know what they're capable of. And especially those students who are wanting to, I mean, everybody in Nepal, probably similar to Pakistan, they have dreams of studying abroad, just like you have to go sure. to Sweden. And I don't know about Sweden, but if you go to America, you go to England, you go to Australia, if they catch you cheating, you're going to get kicked out. True, plagiarism is a big thing. So if they don't understand that now, there's no way they'll be able to ever have that um, success in studying abroad. Then I have other students where they have no aspirations outside of their village, which is fine. And even though that they have the ability to perform higher, to go to university, if they want to stay in their village, it's okay. But the whole point is I'm trying to help them in this period of time that I have them within these next two years in Nepal. And it's coming down to, first of all, during testing time, I need to be strict with them. When we're having classes, I need to teach the material in a way that they can understand. And it's difficult now because I'm not the sole teacher in my classroom. I'm splitting my classrooms with a Nepali counterpart. So what that means is, while I might one day give them, present some material that they can easily understand, the next day my Nepali counterpart is giving them a lecture that not a single person can understand a word they're saying. So there is this back and forth between two teaching styles. And my ultimate goal is not necessarily to reach the students, because I'm only seeing my students for two years, is to reach the teachers so when I'm gone, the teachers can continue to help even more students. So in the end, to curb cheating is to make sure we're presenting this material in a way that they can understand. And 
Honestly, I think it's also building connections with students to take them aside. I know you cheated. Let's talk about why. And that's something I don't necessarily see with some of my counterparts, hardly any of them, is building these personal relationships with your students and tell them, you cheated. You didn't need to cheat. Let's talk about why. Because what it comes down is to they're lazy and they just want to make sure they get the right answers and don't want to work through it. True. Well, let's talk a little bit about the cultural component of um, why that is a problem. I mean, let's get to the root of that. I mean, because from your conversation, it looks like if you're putting a lot of um, effort, time, and um, thought in trying to find ways um, to curb cheating, your counterpart is probably encouraging them to you know, stay in the status quo and to do the things that they have been doing for a long time. So it seems like it's an endemic systemic problem. Um, I mean, you've been in Pakistan for a while now. Um, you have had conversations with a lot of people on streets, um, um, in houses, um, a lot of smart, intelligent people. Um, and I don't think that our problems are very different from Nepal to being the remnants of uh, post-colonial um, era. I guess the curriculum that we have been taught uh, since our independence is still very outdated, uh, and it encourages students to actually cram the information and then reproduce it to sort of prove your mental activity um, and intelligence to fulfill the things um, and steps that you were ordered to do that. So you, they're actually training good servants, like public servants, clerics, administrative positions, and we're not training them to be leaders. We're not training them to think about um, possible alternatives or groundbreaking ideas from scratch. So what do you think has to be done on a cultural level? Is, is, it, is it a societal problem and not the educational problem? Or do you think it has its roots in the way we already administer the policies that are in place? For example, we're talking about Nepal that they already have these action plans, they already have these curriculum and guidelines and monitoring um, procedures assigned to them by the government, but they're never carried out in a way that's effective and then lo that's long lasting. And I guess um, I would totally identify that uh, problem in Pakistan also. But what do you think? It, does it have its roots um, in a cultural phenomenon or do you think it's purely educational problem and any reforms um, in educational sector will change it? Well, I believe that education does not stop and start with the confines of a school. And in any country from America, Nepal, Pakistan, typically if the parents value education, so will the students. And usually the students that perform well in school are the parents that do value education to make sure they do work as much work at home as they do within the classroom. And um, I have this one student, she is from a lower caste family, as they do in like many Hindu countries, they have um, the caste system. And despite her parents not being educated, having formal education, they have value in education. Therefore, she is performing very well in school and she very outspoken and she will con contribute during class. She will ask questions, which I think is fantastic. But I think many of the students who underperform it, they come from families that do not place that value on education. Maybe they think going to school is important, but when they come home, they think that work is finished. In terms of doing homework, in terms of studying, looking over the textbook, that value at home is not there. So that is one thing is, I would say that even applies to America. Many of the underperforming students are the kids whose parents don't value education, or they blame the teachers for not teaching the students when they should be doing extra work at home as well. I think it has something to do with the socioeconomic background of the parents also. But do you think a correlation between, you know, the wealthier you are and the more importance you're going to put in education? Or does it have to be with the fact that, you know, no matter how rich or poor you are, um, it's just the way it is? I mean, what you think about education in general and that transfers to the next generation and posterity? I think there are many different factors that contribute to it. I Typically, if you come from a poor economic family, then their value or their importance, their day-to-day -day goal would just be surviving. And many of them work in the fields and they think their children, that's gonna be their goal in life is to work in the fields with them. 
Um, so any aspirations, any dream of outside the village is pretty much not existing for the parents. They might understand that going to school is a good thing, but they have other priorities. And on top of that, I have other students that come from broken homes with like a single mother, a single parent, or only live with grandparents. And that's also a big contributing factor to if they're going to perform well, if they're going to behave. Um, also, in terms of discipline at home, I would say if they're going to be running around the classroom, not listening, if they're just going to be goofing off, especially the boys, they're guilty of that. Just trying to make everyone else laugh. Um, so I wouldn't say there's one single point that you could point at and say, this is the problem, let's fix it. I think every single student has their own set of issues as, I mean, even us, as if we were coworkers, maybe we don't get along. We all have different reasons on why don't we get along. Why don't we work together? And then everyone has their different um, skeletons in the closet, so to speak. So it's important to keep all these factors in mind and know how to address them. Okay. And uh, I was thinking in general about um, I mean, if you had done everything right, the previous um, um, conversation we just had was about um, the socioeconomic background and reforms in the educational sector and the attached uh, in the government a level of support. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the incentive that students um, get after they graduate from school, uh, primary school, or be it high school or university. If that's not aligned to actually create value for students, that is not going to help them in their pursuit towards education. For example, let's talk a little bit about gender differences in education. Um, most of the females, I mean, if they're working in fields, let's talk only about Nepal or Google, Pakistan, or even in India. I mean, it, they're, they're perceived to be someone who is a homemaker and they're going to get married very um, early, uh, depending on um, when it, if, if there's a probable suitor um, coming in time and they are supposed to, you know, make family. And that's why education is probably not very important for them. And also with the boys, I mean, if they're the single one, then like you mentioned, if they're from poor socioeconomic background, they're supposed to help in the fields or at the shop or at the workshop wherever their parents work, and they're supposed to help them. And then even after they graduate, when they don't get good jobs because of um, in unemployment or, um, you know, lack of industry or um, <laughs> agriculture or anything. I mean, they're supposed to be helping their parents and, and not getting the job that will take them away from their parents and all the brunt of the work will come on their older parents, which they cannot handle properly. Do you really think that this mismatch between the incentives that you give for the education to students and its perceived value is the reason why most people don't take education seriously also and they're not very enthusiastic about the children and going to higher educational institute uh, because in their eyes it's only a waste of money because eventually they're going to you know get married or be working mm -hmm. in the field so what's the point in getting a master's so the first part we're talking about incentives and having a quality especially so starting with education i think it's important to start what incentives i don't know if you have any of these in pakistan but in nepal they will actually give scholarships to students to come to school and the two scholarships I know of is, first of all, is for girls. So if you're a family and you send your girl to school, you'll get a little bit of money from the government. And also if you're from a lower caste, so it as a Dalit, and those are to the lowest caste in the Hindu hierarchy system. So for those two reasons, if you're either a girl or if you're of a lower caste, the Dalits, you will get actual money from the government to bring your kids to school. And they will actually, um, in certain communities around Nepal, for child workers, and I know that's also a problem in Pakistan with children working in the shop rather than mm -hmm. going to school. Um, in some areas, the teachers and principals will visit the families to try to bring the kids to school. So that is something they're doing right to an extent. Um, but even then, I have students who are from Dalit families that have lots of money who don't need scholarships, and they're almost embarrassed about it, saying, my caste does not define how rich or poor I am. Is it one of the factors? Uh, I mean, how do these how do these children assimilate in normal class? For example, if there's a Brahmin um, child in your class and there's a Dalit child. I mean, I don't know how do teachers treat them, or how do you um, think that you know they have um, self perception of um, how they fit in the class? Is it a factor? Have you noticed something? I actually haven't that haven't hardly at all. I'm fortunate that many of my teachers are extremely progressive 
And despite them maybe having some outdated teaching practices in terms of um, male, female equality, in terms of looking at all the castes being the same, they are they are champions on that. And even in Nepal, um, on paper, it is a law that the caste system should be outlawed. In practice, it's still there, but uh, I would say in the classroom, I've not seen any discrimination. That being said, there are some vill- um, houses around the village, village where you will find some of the older generation, people in their 70s, 80s, who still would not let Dali people like, enter the house. Okay. Um, and even then, when a woman is menstruating, she's not allowed to enter the kitchen. You're not allowed to touch the woman who's menstruating. So there's still certain cultural... Can we talk about um, the um, education culture in schools um, over here in Nepal, also in your experience in Chinese? Um, universities um, is very different from uh, what you're used to back home. Um, not both in terms of you know, ideological fitting and also in terms of how it's implemented in real life. So what are some of the things that you think um, can be taken away from your schooling back home? And what, are you, what do you think are some salient points um, of U.S. education and probably developing countries can take it uh, from them? And what do you think are some of the points in South Asian um, education system that might be helpful for students back home um, in the U.S.? I think it's definitely a case of both sides need what the other sides have, and you need to have a mixture of both. Um, Starting with South Asia, or Asia in general, something that can be taken away for not necessarily teaching practices in the United States and the West, but in terms of students' work ethic. Um, to be honest, Nepal, not so much, but I would say China, Vietnam, they have a very good work ethic when it comes to studying, but it comes down to actually taking reading material, actually preparing for tests. I would say they spend the better part of their day uh, preparing for these examinations and taking their um, actual book knowledge. And that is something that is not often seen in the United States. But I would also, that's a double-edged sword. I would say that there's part of that that is good, and there's, and it can be very beneficial, but there's also some aspects of that which deprive students of um, any kind of social lives, any like nurturing some interest that they have, um, any form of recreation that I've seen that some of the students have been turned into more of a job. And that is, of course, the extreme of that is negative, but I would like to see that maybe more American students value the education and value some of the more book learning aspects of education, which I think that is something that um, Asia is very well indoctrinated into that, how they study. Um, now, when you turn the tables and you look at from the West, looking um, at the East, I don't necessarily like to say that these are Western practices. I like to say that these are practices that have been championed by much, much of the developed world, which is not limited to the West. So that would also put Hong Kong, Singapore, um, also under that umbrella. So places where we talk about academia, where they're very prevalent. So I don't like to say that it's the West bringing their ideology and putting that on. Um, South Asia, Pakistan, Nepal, but it's many places in the developed world, such as other places also in Asia, um, who work together to develop these practices. And what it comes down to is um, uh, something that we've talked about before was to put your own mark on your own knowledge. It's not just a textbook. It's not just the teacher who's giving you this information. If we did nothing but just... um, kind of filter the knowledge that a book gave us or filter the knowledge that a teacher gave us without putting our own imprint on it and processing that and saying, what do we agree with? What do we disagree with? And formulating our opinions, then there would be no progress because we're just recycling the same information we've heard for hundreds of years. So in order to develop critical thinking, um, teachers need to be open to debates, open to discussions and be willing to accept that sometimes textbooks are wrong and themselves are wrong. And that can be done in a respectful way. But what it comes down to 
people need to ask questions and question the framework of how things we perceive things are in order to realize these things are sometimes incorrect to develop opinions and develop progress. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to final segue from uh, what we were just talking about um, the ideals of um, Western education philosophy boiling over to all developing countries like Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, I mean, there's certainly more than just educational philosophy that's coming to um, developing countries, etc. Where um, there's a lot of antagonism associated with uh, being someone from U.S. Also, I mean, U.S. has had, um, but to say the least, um, kind of rocky relationship with the rest of the world um, in terms of uh, political, political engagement. Um, for example, Vietnam, uh, you've had um, you know brutal war there. Um, it wasn't good for anyone, um, and same can be said for a lot of countries in the Middle East um, and South America also. So you have uh, traveled a lot um, in these um, countries, um, at least in, in Southeast Asia. But what do you feel in America um, when you interact with people? Do you feel that um, there's a certain antagonism in their voices and their behavior? Um, is it the same that they treat? other foreigners with or do you sometimes you know feel um saying aloud and discriminated against i don't know i mean what is your experience well i think most people no matter where you are in pakistan afghanistan iraq they understand what the united states government does but when they actually meet an american person they don't necessarily hold the crimes of the government against the individual um i've found that most people when they meet me, they'll try to bring up the President Obama shot just to try to build a connection. Um, they'll try to name a few states that they know in the United States. But there's not generally any anger or hostility towards me. Um, I think it comes down to even when you look at Israel. I mean, just because you're Israeli doesn't mean you're a Zionist who you're occupying the Palestinians. And even the frictions now with India. There are many Indians who support Kashmir. And many of my Indian friends support Kashmir. So even the second you meet an Indian, you would not necessarily, I would hope most Pakistani people would want to maybe have that conversation before they jump to a conclusion of where their political allegiances may lie. So I found that most people, they are, and this is surprisingly, most people are fairly open minded. And they would recognize that as an individual that you do not necessarily have to answer for the crimes of your country. And it also comes down to there's two sides of America. There's the hard power, there's the soft power. And this is something that China has been developing rapidly, which obviously scares America, which I think is a good thing. America should be scared. And then they can maybe improve. But yes, on one side there's drone attacks and yes there's military, but we're also giving the world McDonald's, giving them movies give them music. So I think many people are good at differentiating between what is a crime of the government and what is actually an American culture. Yeah, I guess you know, I have to agree with the fact that, you know, um, the good comes with that and everything should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but finally, um, I mean, this has been a very candid conversation um, and I hope um, more of these conversations appear uh, between different cultures. Um, with people with different colors and skin and languages and religions, so that we have some degree of understanding and um, acceptance and um, tolerance towards each other to create a more prosperous and universally um, inhabitable place. Um, do you have any um, final um, comments or um, ways in which you know we can bring the world together so that we focus on the positives and not the negative and divisive and polarized? Um, opinions that we sometimes hold as part of our stereotypes just because we didn't have enough opportunities to hear from the other side and you know, understand their concerns and fears and address them um, in, a, in a manner that is acceptable for both. I think when it comes down to it, that there's many stereotypes on uh, that you hear from people, even probably you. When your family gets together with your friends, you'll start to hear some of these stereotypes being thrown around about people from certain areas, people from certain cultures. And even um, if you do have this impression of people, 
because you need to, I can even tell you that when sitting in China, my impression of Pakistani people is quite bad in terms of the male international students who kind of club together on Hindu religion and conscious. And that's not just limited to Pakistani. I've had a bad impression of Russian people. I've had a bad impression of Kazakh people. But usually when I have this bad impression of um, a group of people, um, due to the small group that I see at my university, I make a point to travel to their country. So I've been to Kazakhstan, I've been to Russia, I've been to Pakistan. And these stereotypes that can be developed, and even I would say many Chinese people that live in China have these stereotypes about Kazakhs, about um, Hong Pakistani people. So they, if you get in a taxi, if the taxi driver, they start saying some bad things about them. But the second you go to the country, you, your mindset on them will totally change. They're just like everyone else. So there's just this one group of people that necessarily um, made this stereotype something that is very prevalent in these communities. And that just shows how dangerous that a small group of um, people or you developing an opinion prematurely, how that can be very detrimental. It can be very harmful to um, the fabric between two people um, mutual understanding each other. And then it's also important as me as a foreigner, especially in Pakistan, where you do not have many foreigners, uh, foreign tourists, to act as an ambassador. So if I happen to be in a bad mood someday and somebody is being overly hospitable or being quite aggravating, I need to make sure I'm putting on that fake smile because if I yell at them, which I'm guilty of, but they're going to go back to their village and back to their families and say, oh, all Americans yell at Pakistani people. Or, so it's very, you have to be an ambassador when you're abroad and when you do meet people that are not necessarily um, the kindest, you need to, again, take it with a grain of salt and make a point to travel to that country or meet other people or do research and figure out why things are the way they are. Exactly. Well, thank you for being on the show. It was wonderful having you here. Um, and I hope next time we meet up here with more time and to explore uh, the country and uh, get to know a little bit more. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. I guess. Uh, you're right.